pays. Ask, search, knock. Ask, and it will be given you. Search, and you will find, knock, and the door will be opened for you. Everyone who asks receives, everyone who searches finds, Everyone who knocks finds an open door. Ask, search, knock. Receive, find, open. Jesus' words sound out for us the rhythm of prayer, like the beat, beat, beat of the drum. Ask, search, knock. This is the pattern of our prayer. In prayer, we often ask God for things. We know, or think we know, what we want from God. So we name our needs and our desires. We ask Bless, O Lord. Deliver, O Lord. Save, O Lord. Sometimes we ask, Dear God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change. The courage to change the things I can and the wisdom to know the difference. Dear God, Give me a little brother in time for Christmas. <laughs> Dear God, keep my little brother safe. Dear God, make my little brother disappear. <laughs> when we don't know what to ask, sometimes we search. We randomly name our thoughts before God like the space between the light switch and the bed. We grope around in the dark, having forgotten where even the most familiar things are. As seekers, we go to prayer not knowing what we want, but relying on God to point it out. I'm unhappy. I'm in a bad mood. I don't know what I want. I'm mad at myself. I'm mad at you. So show me the way, Jesus. Show me the way. And sometimes no words come, and all we find is a door. And in that case, all we can do is knock. And sometimes we knock softly and patiently by opening a prayer book and reciting its well-worn words. Other times, we pound erratically, shouting so loud that we expect our sorrow to separate the clouds and God to reach down and pick us up. Sometimes all we can do is knock. For we do not know how to pray as we ought, but that very spirit intercedes with sighs too deep for words. Ask, search, knock. These are the beats and the rhythm of our prayer. In drought, we pay, pray for rain. In war, we pray for peace. In frustration, we pray for guidance. In turmoil, we cry out. Jesus taught us the rhythm of prayer. But he didn't just use his words, he also used his life. And he withdrew to a quiet place to pray. 
and he went up the mountain to pray. And he left them there and went by himself to pray. Jesus tells us, but he also shows us constantly that we need to punctuate our lives with prayer. Now, we are not strangers to this. We have a rhythm, morning prayer, noonday prayer, evening prayer, Compline. And that's just a minimum. <laughs> Ask Mother Julia. <laughs> For centuries, she's right. <laughs> For centuries, <laughs> there have been daily prayer offices, monastic prayer offices, matins, lauds, prime, tears, sect, Nuns, sext, excuse me, <laughs> nuns, vespers, compline. Such is the rhythm of Christian life. The daily office offers us time to sink into psalms, to whisper familiar collects, and to offer our personal petitions to God. We pray for Michael, our presiding bishop, John, our chancellor, and for all our bishops. That's how we normally do it here. This is what we do as Christians. We, we pray. Even right now, we're engaged in common prayer. And the, the red book gives us the words, the slow and steady beat of our lives. And even prayers within the prayer book rites, within its pages, have standard rhythms. The collects have standard rhythms. If Ken hasn't taught you this, he will. S second faculty shout out. If Ken hasn't taught you this, he will. <clears throat> they have every prayer has an address, an attribution, a petition, a reason, and a conclusion, or a doxology. Address, dear God. Attribution, almighty and ever-living Father. Petition, give us strength. Reason, so that we may more perfectly serve you. Doxology. In the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. It's a rhythm. The rhythm pulsates inside of us. It becomes part of who we are. We pray when we're thankful, like before meals or when we gather with old friends. And we, we pray when we're nervous, like when the professor is passing out the midterm or just before we meet our beloved's parents for the first time. We pray uh, when we have work to do at board meetings and Bible study. We pray at the bedside for healing and for peaceful death. Jesus taught us this rhythm. So we do it. It's a simple concept, easy to understand, but you don't always do it very well. <laughs> and I don't always do it very well. I doubt, I wander, I fidget. If you're like me, sometimes the rhythm of your prayer is interrupted because you get distracted. What is appropriate to include? Things that I need, things that I want, things that I think others need? No matter what I have to offer, it always feels inadequate. Please, God, I need to pass this exam. 
No, that's too self-serving. I pray, Lord, that I am not like them. <laughs> That's judgmental. <laughs> Please, God, cure my flu. But other people have it, so cure theirs too. I don't want to be selfish. Lord, thank you. Thank you that this sermon is a success. <laughs> But that's too, that's too self-congratulatory. <laughs> In silence, at the daily office, uh, I name family and friends rapid fire, only to find myself worrying about who I did not name. Oh no, I prayed for Susan this morning, but I just talked to her. And Nanette could probably use it more. And then there's Diego, who I always forget. And what about Grandma? What about Grandma? Do you do that? Do you edit your prayers? <laughs> no, I won't ask God for anything this evening. I've been asking for too much lately. I do that. You might do it too. I wonder. I wonder if you're... Prayers feel inadequate sometimes, like mine do. How many more children must die? How many more women must be groped? Does it ever feel inadequate? I can't stand the feeling of failing in prayer. But Here's the conclusion I've come to. I'm not. There's no reason for you to censor your prayer. I think a lot of us spend a great deal of time and energy trying to perfect the rhythm of our prayers. But that's not the point. Jesus tells us to pray to God however we need to, by asking, or searching, or knocking, or maybe it's all of those at once. But as long as you are praying, you are participating in God's rhythm for your life. We pray to communicate with God. We don't have to be in touch with God. God already knows us better than we know ourselves. But we talk to God because we are in relationship with God. And that's what you do when you're in a relationship. You talk. You talk to each other. It's not always perfect, but it's part of the rhythm. It's part of the rhythm of life together. Hi, honey, how was your day? Fine. <laughs> Is that all? Don't I get anything more? It was okay. I got stuck at the bank for a long time. I just don't want to tell you every detail because I'm tired and I just got home from work. What we say to each other is rarely perfect. But we have the conversations because they are important to us. It's important to that rhythm, and it's important to God. God understands when you don't. God handles the onslaught of your disorganized thoughts even better than your professors. <laughs> God doesn't require you to cite any sources or tag any friends. <laughs> God just wants to hear from you. God just wants to hear from you. And I think it must be a most pleasing sound, the rhythm of God's people in prayer.
there is perhaps no better time to settle into a new discipline or rhythm than this season. And if you do, if you do settle into a rhythm of prayer, resettle, if you do, I think you might be surprised by what happens. I don't think you'll be surprised because your attitude changes or because you feel more peaceful or because you are more connected or because you're called to action. I actually think you can anticipate those things. But if you settle into a a rhythm of prayer, I think you'll be surprised to find that you are not the one in control. And that's okay. You didn't start the beat. It belongs to the one from whom all blessings flow. So just try to feel the divine rhythm. Snap your finger. Clap your hands, tap your toes, and pray. <laughs>